Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome back to part three. And this will be the last part of our journey in the GI applications in the acute abdomen. I was speaking before about GI bleeding, and we showed some examples, but I want to make a few points when we look at the colon. Number one cause is diverticulitis. We do dual phase CT because sometimes the bleed is best seen on the venous phase. Sometimes you can see it on both phases, but it's very subtle on the arterial phase, like this case. You do see an area of brightness, and you should recognize that as a bleed. And maybe you're worried, maybe it's not. But look what happens when you go to venous phase. Look how brisk the bleeding is. So one thing I can now say, this very brisk bleeding, so angio will probably be positive. Very nice example. There it is in the coronal view with 3D. Again, look how much more obvious the bleed is on the venous than arterial phase. You often will see it, as I noted, in both phases, but this increases your sensitivity. Another example, GI bleeding. Here it is. You can see very nicely, <clears throat> excuse me, the bleed in the descending colon, diverticulitis. Nicely shown in the coronal view, nicely shown on the MIP. The MIP is often better. And there it is again, a few more MIP images. And then as you go a little bit later, you can see the bleed has increased on the axials, on the coronals. So again, dual phase imaging becomes very, very important. Uh, CT AGO in the emergency setting, lower GI bleed, picks up the bleed in most cases. Accuracy in this one article, 98%. We also talk about it uh, amongst many things. Uh, in patients who want to get colonoscopy, perhaps the first thing should be CTA. If the CTA is not negative or the CTA is negative, you shouldn't do colonoscopy because the likelihood of you intervening is low. CTA is positive. It makes sense to intervene. We also notice to look carefully not only across the colon but also into the rectum. That's an area that tends to be overlooked. You can see in this case, patient with ulcerative colitis, look how bright the rectum is. But when you look at the sagittal view, you really can appreciate it. You look at the MIP, look at the feeding vessels, look at the blush, active bleeding, ulcerative colitis. Beautifully shown volume rendering 3D, and then in the MIP reconstructions. Then I take away the bone, and look how nicely you see the IMA, the feeding vessels to the bleed, and that very active blush, which was the cause of the patient's GI bleeding. And then with negative display, very nicely shown. Very nice examples. Um, urgent CT for determining the optimal timing of colonoscopy. We mentioned this a few moments ago. Now even colonoscopists are gonna use CT to determine when they should do colonoscopy. The rate of detection of bleeding source in colonoscopy was significantly higher in patients with positive CT scans, 68 to 20. Indeed, very important. Now, no talk about the acute abdomen would be complete without talking about intestinal ischemia and bowel infarction, which can be arterial, occlusion secondary to atherosclerosis, older population, occlusion due to emboli, often a younger population, or trauma. Also, venous disease, venous thrombosis, portal hypertension, patients on estrogen. Things we look at, the earliest finding of ischemic bowel is just bowel dilated with fluid. That's typically not very helpful. Then you go to bowel wall thickening. You may see dilated mesenteric veins, edema in the mesenteric fat, intramural gas, and mesenteric and then portal venous gas, which are very um, omnip omnipotent signs. You see the air in the portal venous system is usually ischemic bowel, and that patient has a high morbidity, high mortality. The things we look for, we look at the vessels. Is there plaque present? Is there stenosis? Sagittal views are critical. Here, this plaque, origin of the celiac, lots of plaque in the SMA, calcified and non-calcified, but the vessels are patent. In this case, you see occlusion of the SMA. You see it on the axials, and you see it better on the sagittal view. And here it is with MIP. It's occluded proximally, and then you see flow distally. Again, occlusion due to thrombus proximally. Another example here is very subtle thrombus, which I'm showing in the proximal SMA. You can see it better and its extent 
when you look at the sagittal views. And you can see there. And then you see the thickened bowel and ischemic bowel. Sometimes it's not so much the narrowing, but it's the caliber. Here, look at the caliber of celiac and SMA. It's like little thin lines. You know this patient has decreased flow. This is going to be ischemic bowel due to a low flow state. The bowel is dilated. There's poor perfusion. But look how the mesenteric vessels, celiac and SMA, have all clamped down. Sometimes you'll notice the bowel is dilated, but you really notice it's not the enhancement you would expect from a good injection. You look more closely, there's air in the bowel wall, there's some distension, and then you look at the sagittal, and sure enough, the patient's SMA is occluded for a long segment. This case also shows very nicely the importance of looking at the 3D reconstructions. Just looking at the proximal SMA on axial is not going to help you because here the SMA looks great. There's not even any calcified plaque, for God's sakes. This is really where it's a challenge because people often will look at the proximal SMA, it looks good, and stop there. This patient had intervention, and now you see the SMA a couple weeks later looking good. Nicely shown. Or this example, SMA looks good in the first few centimeters, then it's occluded, and the patient has ischemic bowel. Patient went to surgery, the cloud was removed, the bowel became pink again, and the patient did not get bowel resection. You can see it here again. Look at the sagittal views. Sagittal views are critical. Again, if you look quickly, you'll only see the proximal SMA, if you look at the axials, and it's going to look good, but look at the occlusion of the SMA here. And in this example, looks good, the SMA, but then when you go far enough, you can see it's occluded, so you really need to look carefully. Here's the nice vessel until it's occluded. Proximally looks great, but then it's occluded, and that's what causes the patient's symptoms. So again, you need to be very careful. I track the vessels down with, I look at the axials, but the sagittals to me are the most critical thing I have. Or in this case, look at the patient's SMA. You see the branches to the um, iliocolic branches are occluded. You see the bowel is a little bit dilated, but the occlusion is what's critical. This patient, uh, despite heroic efforts, did not recover. Again, large-scale occlusion, induration, infiltration. The bowel doesn't look bad here, but it's the vessel, and that vessel then led to the patient developing ischemic bowel and infarction and eventually dying. And you can see this very nicely on this image as well. Here's a 3D reconstruction showing you the um, ileal branch of the SMA to be occluded. Just very nice presentation of those images. And here it is again. So. Uh, maybe cinematic rendering will come to the rescue and help us not miss some of these cases. Ischemia is the complication that increases the morbidity and mortality associated with bowel obstruction. The mortality rate in patients who undergo surgery for SBO with ischemic bowel is as high as 25% compared to those without strangulation, where it may be as low as 2%. When ischemia is suspected, immediate surgery is required. And that becomes so important. If you can get in fast enough, you can potentially save the patient. Again, findings, wall thickening, mesenteric edema, fluid, decreased enhancement of bowel, pneumatosis, portal venous gas, vessel occlusion, narrowing, all the things you need to think about. And so it does become very important. So it is a challenging diagnosis, but particularly in an older population, particularly in the patient from the ER with unexplained abdominal pain, you better make certain you rule out ischemic bowel. Look at the vessels, look at the bowel, look carefully on every single case. You don't need to say, well, the, the clinicians didn't request it, they often will not. They'll just say abdominal pain. You need to be um, uh, the uh, person who finds that ischemic bowel. Now, one last topic to mention, vague abdominal pain, non contrast is an unimpressive, it was a stone protocol. You give contrast, look at the SMA. There's a dissection of the SMA, which you can see on further views, which you can see the length of the dissection of the SMA. What's going on here? And you can see when you look at this case, not only do you see the dissection, but in the branches, the jejunal branches, look at that um, beating of branches off the SMA. What the heck is going on there? Well, this is what's called spontaneous dissection of the splanchnic arteries. Intimal flap, thrombose, false lumen, and aneurysm of dilatation are the most common findings. Uh, in splenic artery dissection, conservative management has good outcome, except in patients with ischemia.
So it's very important not to put stents in, which they did, or rush with anticoagulant therapy. Although surgery should be considered first in the presence of bowel infarction, conservative management without anticoagulant therapy has had good outcomes in these patients. So again, may be counterintuitive, but it's something to watch out for. Another thing to be looking for, aortic enteric fistulae, uncommon, but um, it's most common in patients who've had aortic graft repairs. Then they get inflammation uh, and fistulization between the fourth portion of duodenum and the colon. The classic triad of abdominal pain, GI hemorrhage, and pulsatile mass is classic because it rarely occurs. Things we look for, air within the aortic lumen or adjacent to aorta, direct contact without extravasation, or direct contact with extravasation from the aorta to bowel or bowel to aorta, the effacement of the plane between the bowel and adjacent aorta, focal bowel wall thickening adjacent to the aorta, and periaortic soft tissue thickening and fluid. So what you don't want to see is bowel loops being draped over the uh, vessels, again, most commonly in the third, fourth portion of duodenum, that can occur in patients with an adherent bowel, which occurs in select cases. Nice example here, big aneurysm, high density, endovascular stents. But look at the air in the uh, aneurysm just at the level of the patient's duodenum. That's a autoenteric fistula, the most classic examples. High morbidity, high mortality in these patients. Another example here, you see air around the uh, grafts in aorta uh, by iliac, but there was no recent procedure. And you can see the air tracking upward, lots of air within the, uh, the uh, graft, and that's infection, that's fistulization, that needs immediate intervention. So now we've gone full circle. I mentioned about from the beginning, was ER the wrong place for CT? Were we overusing it? Were we misusing it? All of the criticisms. But as Thrall says, given current concerns about healthcare costs and radiation exposure, it's critical for physicians to weigh the risk of radiation and the cost benefit of doing a CT. And when you look at the numbers and you look at what I showed you, it's clear CT is cost effective, it saves lives, it saves money, and it expedites patient management. It's the study of choice in the acute abdomen. The key is triage, the key is protocols, key is 3D imaging in many of the cases. Uh, again, it's important to do dedicated studies, not just go five by five, you're gonna miss a lot of things. So it's very important to kind of balance those things together. But I think if you do it, you're gonna be very satisfied with your CT team, and you're gonna do a great job in the acute abdomen. Again, there are many more topics I could have covered, and there's many more from the other tracks, like the GU track, the spleen, but I think that'll have to wait till next time. See you then. Bye-bye.